All right. This morning we start a brand new series. And this morning's uh, message is a family tree. We're going to be looking at some Christmas related uh, things from the scriptures. We're going to look at the story of Jesus' birth and talk about some things that are going to help us in our life. There's so much that you and I can learn uh, from these stories that will impact us personally. And I think this morning is going to be no exception to that for sure. How many of you guys have ever uh, researched your family history? Anybody looked back into your past and done some genealogy? All right, some of you. Uh, I haven't done too much of that, but I know that um, mom and dad did some looking into some things. And so we've seen a little bit. I know that uh, the name Comer is uh, Irish. And the, there were four brothers that came to the United States during the potato famine in the 1800s. So that's where just about all the Comers in this country probably came from, those four brothers. So somewhere back, we're all related, we're all kin. But, you know, so I know that much, so I got Irish in me. And on my mom's side, I know we have French and Iroquois and Cherokee. And so there's a whole, you know, we're all mixed breeds, aren't we? We all have all kinds of things in our heritage. And, and if we look back, we find some interesting things and some surprising things and Maybe even some disturbing things. Uh, I know that dad somehow, I don't know how he found this out, but he found out that somewhere in our history, there is a relationship with our family and Jesse James. I don't know. But I'm so thankful God redeems the past, aren't you? <laughs> I'm so glad for that. I am not like anything like Jesse James. But you know what? All of us have little things in our past, little skeletons in the closet that uh, we may not want other people to know about. Uh, so, you know, I probably can never run for office because somebody might dig that one out. Yeah, he's related to Jesse James. Genealogy has become a big deal. And it's become actually a big industry lately. Uh, there are websites like An Ancestry.com where you can go on and, you know, you pay for the service. But you can look up all kinds of things and you have access to all kinds of records. I found another uh, website called Cindy's List. And on that website, she lists um, all kinds of links to other websites where you can do research. Some of them are free and some of them are paid sites. But the, the, she categorizes everything. And I just kind of just quickly perused it and I, and I clicked on Alabama because there's a, a category for, for states. So I clicked on the state of Alabama and that category has a total of 3,372 web pages related to genealogy just for the state of Alabama. There's a lot of information out there. Some of that's scary because your information is out there public in public records that anybody can get access to. But hey, that's, it's a big business these days. People are really looking into their past and uh, they, they're curious, some of them, but some of them maybe are looking for something that will give them a connection from their past and maybe a, a, a sense of purpose for their present. So people are really looking into these kinds of things, trying to figure out what's going on. If we look into the Bible, we find out that the Bible has lots of information about genealogies. I mean, you, you've probably, if you've done any Bible reading, you've run across a list of family names. And you've, you've seen, if you're like most people, you get to that list of so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, oh, skip that. What's, what's past that? Let's go past that. I remember when I was in fifth grade, I got the Gideon New Testament. Anybody else get one of these when you were in school? All right. Fifth grade. Only the old people. What's going on? Gideon's got a... <laughs> this, I don't know if they still do it, but in fifth grade, we got these little New Testaments. And I loved to read when I was in fifth grade. And so when I got this Bible, I was like so excited. Our family at that point in our, our time, we didn't really go to church except maybe on Easter. And I thought, oh man, I'm going to read this all the way through. And so I picked it up and I opened it up to Matthew and I looked at chapter 1. Boy, they've really shrunk these words since 5th grade. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew chapter 1. Uh, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat... Uh, I put it down and I quit. I probably got one or two paragraphs into that and I said, huh, this isn't very exciting at all. Where's my book on astronomy? I want to read something different. You know, so I put it down and I didn't pick it up for many, many years. I got saved as a teenager. And it wasn't until then that I finally started reading the Bible. 
And I've always thought, you know, it's kind of crazy, and it's only from my own personal experience. I thought, why, why does the Bible start with Matthew? Why start with a genealogy? I mean, of, of all the things in the world to start, couldn't we just start with like John, maybe Mark, even Luke? But why start out with this? I mean, it's so, the names beget, 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 beget. As a kid, it kind of turned me off and I didn't want to read anymore. But this is important. This genealogy, it's very important. And Matthew included it for a reason. Because Matthew was writing to Jewish people. And Jewish people are very concerned about genealogies. And there are a number of reasons why Jewish people care about genealogies. One of them is that in Jewish culture, the land belonged to the families. It was given to them by God. God said, I'm going to give you the land of Israel. And he divided it up between all the tribes. And then within the tribes, they divided it up between the clans and the families and so on. And then as time went along, each family passed down their land through inheritance. And the law said that it belonged to that family. And you could sell that land temporarily, maybe to clear a debt or something. But you know what? In the end, that land had to give, be given back to the family. And so people knew that. And so uh, a record of genealogy is important because it proves who you are and what belongs to you. And so inheritance was important to the Jewish people and, uh, and so genealogies were important to them. And then there are some things that are important for this reason. Uh, their jobs depended, some of them, on who they were. Think about it. The Levites all served in the temple. They served the Lord and His service. So it was, it was based on your ancestry. If you were a member of the tribe of Levi, then you were dedicated to serving God in the temple. And if you wanted to be a priest in the temple, not anybody could just come up and apply. You had to be a descendant of Aaron, specifically. And so if you weren't a descendant of Aaron, you couldn't be a priest. And so uh, that record was important. In fact, there were some people after, you remember that the Jews were exiled into Babylon. Then 70 years later, they came back to Israel. And under Nehemiah's uh, rule, they were trying to organize things back together. Some of the people who were priests or Levites couldn't prove their genealogical record. And so they couldn't serve in the temple because they couldn't prove who they were. And so that, that was very important. Kingship was passed down through family lines. Remember, God said to David, you will never uh, cease to have somebody on the throne from your family. And so all of the kings in Judah could trace their lineage back to David. Well, those who were after David anyways. And so they all looked backwards and they saw themselves connected to David through their family history. And then the most important thing about all these genealogies that we find in the Bible is this. Jesus descended from David and he descended from Abraham. And God made a promise to David that you'll never cease to have a ruler on your throne. Today, today there is still a ruler on David's throne and it's Jesus Christ. He is still the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords and he's alive today and he's on the throne in heaven and he's a descendant of David. God kept his promise God kept his promise. And so as we look at this uh, scripture in Matthew chapter 1 and we begin to uh, open it up and, and realize what's going on, we've, we discover that there's something important about this. And so this morning I want to I just take a look at some of it and, and kind of uh, bring it on down to home. So let's start with chapter 1 verse 1 of Matthew. It says in the NIV version it says it this way. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I want you to notice this first of all and that is that God had a plan. God had a plan. God knew that Jesus was going to come. He knew that Jesus would come before there was ever a Roman Empire that was responsible for crucifying Jesus. God knew that Jesus was going to come before there was ever a Jewish nation. Before there was ever prophets. Before the law was written. Before uh, David and before Moses and before Abraham. God already knew that there would be somebody named Jesus. And it, it would be 
uh, it would be the way that God would save mankind. God had a plan from the very beginning. And what, when Matthew lays out this genealogy, one thing that he's showing us is that God had a plan. And his plan spanned thousands of years. Thousands of years. You talk about patient. God is really patient because he waited thousands of years to bring about the promise. And the, the fact, the first hint that God's going to bring a Savior is found in Genesis 3.15. Adam and Eve, the very first couple, sinned against God. They broke their relationship with God. But God said, I'm going to restore that relationship. And he hinted at how he would do it in chapter th 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. He was talking to the serpent. Don't you know that Jesus crushed the head of the serpent? He took away death, hell, and the grave. And Jesus reigns supreme. Even though Satan uh, managed to have Jesus crucified and, and put it in the hearts of people to have him killed, it didn't matter because God's plan triumphed. He struck at Jesus' heel, but Jesus crushed his head. And so Jesus reigns today supreme because of that. And so the very first hint is found all the way back in the very beginning of the Bible. And then as we go through Genesis 49, verse 10, we find a story where Jacob is blessing his children. Remember, he's, he's got the 12 sons, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. And so as he's blessing his children, he gets to Judah. Listen to what he says. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his." Prophetically, Jacob is speaking about the coming of David and of Jesus. This is, you got to understand, when Jacob is blessing his sons, the nation of Israel is a family. It, that's it. It's not millions of people. It's a family. And he's already talking about a ruler. He's already talking about a king. And yet they're just a family. But he spoke prophetically. And God spoke through Jacob. And Jacob said there will come somebody who will be a ruler. And he's going to come through the lineage of Judah. And guess what? David was a descendant of Judah. And Jesus is a descendant of David and of Judah. And so God is showing that he's already got a plan. All the way back in the time of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And God is saying, I'm going to bring about a ruler. And he will be the one. Uh, uh, he says, the scepter will not depart from Judah until it gets to the, into the hands of the person to whom it belongs. Who does it belong to? Rule and authority and power belongs to only one person, God. You understand that? A power and authority belongs to God. And so God said that the, the rulership will be in the hands of Judah's descendants until finally it reaches the ultimate hand. And that is the hand of God in the form of Jesus Christ when he came to earth. So he's already talking about it. And then uh, there are other things like, for example, uh, in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 through 7. This is something we usually hear read at Christmas time. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's talking about a Messiah, a Savior, a Redeemer. Who will come and, and God says he will come out of the family of David. And so of course we know that Jesus is from the family of David. And that's why it was so important for Matthew to include the lineage in the very beginning of his gospel. Because he's writing to Jewish people. And so for them it's very important to understand. Because they know that the Messiah will come from the family of David. And from the family of Abraham. And so he begins by saying that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham and David. That's very important to Jewish people. They understand that God works by having a plan. Jesus was not born to a random person. 
You understand this? It wasn't by pure chance that Jesus was born. God had a specific plan. He called out Mary and he said, I want you to give birth to the Messiah. Now we're going to talk about that next week in more detail. But just think about it. How amazing that must have been for Mary to be chosen to bear the Messiah. And I want you to know something today that God still operates the same way he did back then. God had a plan before you and I were ever thought of. And God has a plan today, even now. Now, I'm not saying to you that every single thing that happens in your life is part of God's plan. Because guess what? You and I make mistakes. We mess up. And we can, we can do things that are not part of His plan. And we can even cause problems in other people's lives that wasn't a part of God's plan. But what I am saying is this, that God is a purpose for your life. God has a reason for your existence. And God does orchestrate things in your life. And he puts you in places. And he connects you with people. And he designs these things because he has an ultimate goal. A plan. An overriding vision for your life. That's an amazing thing when you think about it. Before you were ever thought of. Before you were ever born. God already knew you would exist. And he knew where you would live. And he knew what you would go through. And he's setting up life for you. He's setting it up for you. Man, that's amazing to think about. That God has a plan just for your life. He, he is putting things in motion and, and putting you in places and at times where he, he knows you need to be. I'm so glad that God has a plan for my life. God knew before I was ever born that I would live here in Birmingham, Alabama. And even though I'm a Georgia fan, he knew that Georgia was going to lose to Alabama. Oh, my goodness. But, hey, God's, God's still on the throne. He hasn't left the throne. Okay, now let's move on. Not only does God have a plan, he has a plan for you. But God uses imperfect people to accomplish his goal. How many of you are glad about that? Because those of you who are not glad, it's because you're already perfect and, you, and God doesn't use you. But God uses the, the, um, the imperfect people. And so all of us who are not perfect are very happy that God uses imperfect people. And the rest of you can just close your ears for the rest of this. But the, those of us who are not perfect, we need to hear this part, okay? So just bear with us. God uses imperfect people. Now, when Matthew wrote out this genealogy, you need to understand a little something about how genealogies are written. Whether it's one in the Old Testament or whether it's one of them in the New Testament. They did not write down every single person in the genealogy. They would oftentimes skip generations. And so when it says uh, so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, it might be that he was his grandfather or maybe a great-grandfather, or maybe even a great-great-great-great-grandfather. They included the people that they wanted uh, to include in the genealogy that were important. Now, they kept them straight, but they didn't include every single step in the process. Because there's a whole lot more families. If you trace back from Jesus to Abraham, there's a lot of families missing in Matthew's list. He purposely chose uh, three sets of 14, and he did that because he, he wanted to uh, make a, a, he was doing it for a reason. He wanted his list to be organized and, and everything. He was one of those OCD people maybe, I don't know. But he wanted an organized list and so he purposely chose those sets of people. And so he didn't include every single person. As you go down through, especially when you look at David and uh, the lineage of the kings after David, you can see obviously that people are missing in that list. Because all you have to do is go back and read Kings and Chronicles and you understand that not all the kings are listed there. There's some that he skips generations. So, with that in mind, understanding that this was common Jewish practice, Matthew wasn't trying to do anything that's um, not done by other people. Understanding that this is common, you have to think that he chose the names that he chose on purpose. He included people in this list that he wanted the readers to know about. And he put them there because he thought it was important. And he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, ultimately. So God wanted these names in the list. We understand that. So as we read through this list and see the names that, that Matthew wrote down, we understand that he did it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Lord said, I want you to include these names in the list. And those are the names that are in the list. So 
Knowing that, let's take a look at verse 3. Matthew 1, verse 3. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, and so on. This is the first mention of a woman's name, Tamar. And, and you have to wonder, why, why did he mention Tamar? Normally in genealogies, they didn't include women's names. They only included the men's names. But Matthew included several women. And I think that's a good thing. And I think the women should say, well, that's good because God does care about ladies. And he, he made sure that Matthew included some women in the list. But the first one that he includes is an unusual one. And you say, well, I didn't know that that was Jacob's uh, wife. I didn't know he married. No, he didn't. That's not his wife. In fact, it's a pretty strange story. And the story is found in, in Genesis chapter 38. If you want to read it, don't read it right now. But I'll give you the synopsis. It's, it's like a weird story that's kind of stuck in the middle of, of another scenario that's going on. The Bible's talking about Joseph and all of a sudden it cuts out and it goes to 38. And there's this story that's included about Judah and Tamar. Tamar was actually Judah's daughter-in-law. She was married to his firstborn son, Er, E-R, uh, Er. E -R, er. And... Uh, he was a, not a nice guy. He was an evil man and God killed him. And it was the custom in that day and time that if a woman's husband died, that the brother of the husband would assume the wife and the responsibilities of bearing children. And so the first child that is born with this new relationship would actually be the one who inherits the, the deceased brother's uh, property. So uh, Judah, according to custom allowed his next youngest son, uh, Oman, to be married to Tamar. But Oman was thinking, wait a minute. Now, when we have children, the first child she has is going to inherit my brother's uh, portion. And I don't really like that idea. I don't want my children to inherit my brother, to be my brother's uh, descendants. I want them to be mine. And so, um, it's PG-13, but you go ahead and read it. And uh, he decided to, to not allow uh, Tamar to have children with him. And so God said, well, that's not right. Boom, you're dead. So now she's lost two husbands. And so now Judah's looking around. He's saying, oh, boy, this, this woman's like the black widow. I, every son I give her, she's killing him. What's going on here? And so she says, I need another husband. <laughs> what is this, like Walmart? I need another husband. And so Judah says, now, I don't know about this. He says, you know, my, my next son, well, he's not quite old enough to get married yet. You've already gone through my two oldest boys. Do, do this. Go back to your father's house and live there as a widow. And when he's old enough, I'll send for you. Well, what he was really saying was, I ain't giving you my next son. Because if you, if you marry him, he's going to die too. And so he just sent her off to just kind of push her aside. He didn't want to have anything to do with her. So she goes back home to her, her daddy's house. And in the meantime, time goes along and, and Judah's son grows up. He's old enough to get married, but he's not called for Tamar. And Tamar's starting to get mad about this. And so she says, well, I'm going to just do something about this myself. I'm going to have kids. And so she dresses up like a prostitute and goes to a town where she knows Judah's going to be visiting because she had heard through the grapevine he was doing business or whatever. And he's going to be in this particular town. So she shows up at the town dressed like a prostitute. Judah walks up to her and says, come sleep with me. And so guess what? She gets pregnant by her father-in-law. And uh, in, in order to pay for the prostitution, he's, uh, they agree on the price of like a goat or something. And he says, well, I don't have one on me. Uh, and she says, well, leave me something as a pledge then to prove that you're going to come back and pay me. And so he leaves his family seal, which is a signet ring. Very important. Very important. And so he leaves the signet ring and his staff. Uh, very identifiable objects. And so uh, he leaves town. He's going to go get payment and bring it back. But when he comes back, she's gone because she went back to her dad's house. And uh, so he went around town asking about her. Nobody even knew who she was. He was like, oh, man, I messed up now. So he goes on his merry way. And, and word comes to him later on that Tamar's pregnant. And he says, oh, my goodness, she's pregnant. That means she, uh, she was going around sleeping around with people. 
well, she deserves to be killed. Bring her out, let's kill her. And so they go over to her daddy's house and they bring her out and, the, and they, they're going to kill her. And she comes out with the staff and the signet ring. And she says, well, the one who owns this is the daddy of this child. Judah's like, I, 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 I. okay, uh, well, we, we won't do anything about that. You just go ahead and have your child. It'll be all right. And she had twin boys. And so that's how, uh, that's how Tamar ends up in this list, in this genealogy. Now, that's a pretty sordid tale, isn't it? I told you, it's PG-13. Um, could be R-rated. You know, it depends on how you make the movie. But it's, she gets in, she gets in the story, and she, you understand that the, the twins that she had, one of those twins is eventually an ancestor of Jesus. An illegitimate relationship and illegitimate children. But out of that comes a king, King David, and a savior, Jesus. Hmm, interesting. Well, let's go on. Matthew 1, 5. We see another woman's name. Uh, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Well, wait a minute. Who's Rahab? Okay, Rahab is not even an Israelite. She's not an Israelite. Rahab comes from the story of Jericho. You remember that? Who broke down the walls of Jericho? And all the kids in the junior boys class said, it wasn't me. <laughs> Who broke down the walls of Jericho? Well, God uh, brought the walls of Jericho down as the people of God marched around seven times. You remember that story. Well, before that ever happened, uh, Joshua sent spies into the city to kind of see what was going on in there, scope things out. And when they got in there, they found this woman named Rahab. She was a prostitute. And what's up with all the prostitutes? And so uh, the spies say, listen, will you hide us in your house? Because the authorities are coming around. They know we're in town and they're trying to find us. So she takes them, hides them in her house. As they tell her about the living God, she says, I want to serve your God. I want to change my life. Can I be saved? And they said, yes, we will not, we will not kill you. If you will tie a scarlet rope and hang it outside your window, she lived in an apartment that was built inside the wall of Jericho. So when the walls of Jericho fell, that one slice of the wall stayed up because Rahab's apartment was there and the rope was hanging out the window. And while everybody else in town was slaughtered, she lived in her family. And so she became a part of Israel, even though originally she wasn't. And so God's showing that he takes those who are outsiders and he brings them in. And now she becomes one of those in the lineage leading up to David and leading up to Jesus. You keep reading uh, in that story, and it's in that verse, it, let's read it again. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. And we come up with another woman's name. Uh, Ruth is another person who's not an Israelite. In fact, she's a Moabite. And the reason that's important is when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they wandered through the wilderness, they finally came to the land of Canaan. When they were approaching Canaan, they came to the Moabites and asked for help. And they said, we ain't helping you. And so they ended up having a, a problem with the Moabites. And God said, don't let any Moabites join your, your nation. And so like for so many generations, they said no Moabite could join the Israelite nation. And so they were actually enemies of one another. But yet, the story of Ruth is one of the greatest stories in the Bible. You should read the book of Ruth if you haven't read it. It's a beautiful love story. And um, this woman, who is a foreigner, worshipped foreign gods, looked at her mother, Naomi, and said, I don't want to serve my foreign gods anymore. I want to serve your God. I want him to be my God. And I want to follow you. And I want to be part of Israel. And so she came back with Naomi to Israel and she married Boaz. It's a beautiful story. And she becomes the great-grandmother of King David. Now isn't that wonderful? God's taking these outsiders, bringing them in and making them a part of a story. He's weaving a story made out of all kinds of different threads. That's just like our God. It's just like this church. This church is made up of people from all different walks of life. 
uh, from, from different um, uh, society classes, from different races, from different nations. We are a, a group of people that God has put together, taking threads from all kinds of different places and weaving them into a beautiful tapestry. That's how God works. And that's part of the lineage of Jesus. Well, speaking of the great grandmother of David, let's move on to verse 6. And Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now that's an odd way to talk about Solomon's mother, isn't it? How did that happen? Well, you probably already know the story. But if you go back to the book of 2 Samuel, you'll, you'll read what happened. Um, Solomon's mother was not actually David's wife originally. Originally, she was Uriah's wife. And Uriah was one of the commanders in David's army. But while the army was out fighting, David stayed home and he shouldn't have. He should have been out with his army, but he didn't. He stayed home. And of course, you know the story. He looked down from the top of his palace and he saw Bathsheba. And she was uh, bathing in her backyard. And uh, so he saw her. He said, oh, she's beautiful. Bring her up to me. She was married to another man, but yet he took her anyways. Committed adultery. She came back and said, I'm pregnant. And he said, uh-oh, we got to do something about this. So we brought her husband back from the front lines, hoping that he would sleep with her. And uh, he would think that he was the daddy. That didn't work. And so when Uriah went back to the front lines, David said, have him killed. So David now committed adultery and he committed murder. And the child was born. And he thought he had covered his tracks. He thought everything was okay. And God sent the prophet Nathan to David and said, you haven't covered anything up. I know exactly what you've been up to. I know everything you've done. And this is not hidden and it's, and it's ugly. And you're going to have to pay a price for this. That child's not going to live. So that child did die. And uh, David paid an awful price. Not only in that, but other things happened in his family because of his sin. But eventually... Uh, he did marry Bathsheba and they had another child his name is Solomon and everybody knows Solomon the wisest man who ever lived and he became uh, David's child but it happened out of a bad relationship David really messed up he messed up bad a lot of these people in this list messed up they did some awful things you go down and continue reading the list and you see some other people. For example, Solomon's son Rehoboam. Rehoboam was responsible for splitting the nation of Israel into two. A civil war, a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. That's pretty bad. It lasted for hundreds of years. And then Jehoram was a wicked man. He killed his brothers and forced the people of Israel to worship idols. Ahaz sacrificed his own son to a pagan god and he nailed shut the temple doors. Manasseh also sacrificed his son to a pagan god and he set up an idol inside the temple and murdered his own people. These are some of the people who are part of the list of the genealogy of Jesus. And Matthew included them because God told him to. God wanted to show that uh, everything's open. We're not trying to hide anything here. He wants to show us that God takes imperfect people and yet that doesn't mess up his plan. God can still move forward with his plan. There's some things I think that we can learn as we look at this. I think it reminds us that even though we aren't perfect, none of us are perfect, even though we aren't, God still uses us. God sees something in us that is valuable. Anybody ever watch that show, American Pickers on the History Channel? Anybody? I just love that show. Uh, it amazes me some of the things that uh, Mike and Frank can find. They, they drive up to a yard that looks pretty much like this. And it's, you and I would say, boy, that's junk and trash. But to Mike and Frank, it's treasure. And they will go sifting through rusty cans and, and dirty papers and boxes. And, and they'll find something that they love. And it's amazing. I, I've seen Mike pull stuff out of a... a I saw him pull a, a rusty old bike frame out of... It's covered up with vines. It's been sitting in the weather for decades. And there's hardly anything left to it. And he pulls it out and he says, I'll pay you $1,000 for that. 
What? <laughs> because he sees value in it. I would see it as junk. But he says, I think I know somebody that might want this. Or he might find some old industrial equipment that's been sitting in a dusty warehouse and never been used in, in the last 30 years or 50 years or 100 years. And he says, man, somebody might can make that into some furniture. I want to buy it. And so he finds things that nobody else wants. And then he says, I'm going to repurpose that. I, I think there's value in that. I think there's, that it's worth something. And then he even makes a profit off of it. It's amazing to me the stuff that they find. I believe God is the ultimate picker because God looks at you and me and he says, I don't care what your life is like. Maybe you feel like you're that rusty bicycle that's been thrown out in the field and the vines have grown over you and you feel like you've been thrown out to pasture and nobody wants you and nobody cares. But God says, I care about you and I love you and I see purpose in your life and I believe you're valuable and I believe that I can do something with you. I can repurpose who you are and I can make something wonderful out of you. That's the kind of God we serve. And when you look at this list of people, some of those people you and I would have discarded and said, oh my goodness, somebody like Tamar, oh how could you do something like that? That's such a horrible thing and we would have just written her off. But God says, I'm not writing her off. In fact, I'm going to let one of her children be a part of the lineage of, of the Savior of the world. God sees value in what you and I consider to be junk. Even when we see our own life as being junk, God says, no way. No way. I see great value in you. Tremendous value in you. Never discount yourself. Never discount who you are. Never discount your past. Because God sees something great in you. There's another show on the History Channel called American Restoration. Uh, there's a guy named Rick. And he takes things that are um, old and beat up and he restores them. Like there's an example of it right there. You see an old Coca-Cola cooler. And it's all beat up, the, the, the lid is all warped and it's scratched up, the paint's mostly gone on parts of it and uh, it, it may have parts that are broken and doesn't work anymore. He takes stuff like that and he transforms them so, so that they look brand new as if you just bought it. He can take something a hundred years old that's beat up, worn out and absolutely worthless and turn it into something that looks brand new. Brand new. He restores things. Guess what God does? He restores things. God restores us. God looks at us and he says, Oh, I, I know that, that you in the past, you know, the things are broken and things are messed up. But God says, I can redeem all of that. I can fix all of that. You might feel broken, but I can fix you. I can take you and I can mold you, reshape you, reform you. I can take the bits that are broken and, and pull them all out and I can put some new stuff in. God says, I know you got a heart of stone, but I'm taking that out and doing surgery on you and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh and you're going to be a brand new person. That's the kind of God we serve. God looks back and he says, I see value in you. God looks back and he says, I can restore you. He looked at people like Abram and he said, you know what? You don't have any kids. That's an awful name to have, Abram, because it means father. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to change your name. I'm going to change your name to Abraham, father of many nations. That's more appropriate, isn't it? Because you're going to be the father of many nations. You might not be now, but you will be. I can see what you can become. God looks at a man like Simon and he says, you know what? I'm going to change your name to. I'm going to change your name to Peter because you're going to be a rock. Peter was nothing like a rock. He wasn't stable. He wasn't steady. But God made him into a, a foundational rock in the church. God saw not what Peter was, but what Peter could become. And God sees you and I the same way. He sees what we are, but he also sees what we can become. God wants to give you a brand new name. He says, I, 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 can, I see value in who you are. And what about Peter? Peter publicly denied who Jesus was. You remember that? Jesus said, you know, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter said, no way. I would, I would die first. And yet three times in that one night he denied Jesus. And then the rooster crowed and he said, oh, Jesus said I was going to deny him and I did. He thought he was all washed up. He thought it was all over. He said, I've messed up. I'm ruined. I'm broken. It's finished. He went back to his old job. 
He quit being a disciple of Jesus. He quit. Even after Jesus rose from the dead, he quit. He went back to fishing. But Jesus called him and said, come here. I want to talk to you. And Jesus restored the relationship that Peter had with Jesus. That was the first thing he did. He restored that. And then he not only restored his relationship, he restored his position. He said, Peter, I want you to go feed my sheep. I called you to be a fisher of men, not a fisher of fish. Now you get off that boat and you start doing what I called you to do. I put you in leadership and you're going to stay in leadership. And that's what I've called you to do. Jesus restored Peter. And God restores us. We serve a God who looks at us and says, I don't care how broken you are. I don't care how used up you are. I don't care where you've been and what you've gone through. I can make something out of you. And I can restore you. You're valuable. You're worth something. I think the story of the genealogy of Jesus brings that home to us. It shows us that God can use us no matter what. That you are not, you are not worthless. But you are more precious and more valuable than any commodity on the planet earth or in the universe. Because the living God sees value in you. And if the God who made the universe sees value in you, then you are valuable. I, I like what um, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's how God does things, man. You might look back in your past and say, boy, what a past. Oh, man, I've done some things that I don't want anybody to know. I don't want anybody to know that, Lord. God, I wish you didn't even know about it, but he does. But God says, you know what? In spite of all this stuff that's in your past, all the skeletons in your closet, God says, I'm giving you a new life. I'm giving you a brand new life. We can have a fresh start with God. We can have a fresh start the past can be wiped clean. And God can say to us, you know what? I threw your past in the sea of forgetfulness. I don't even remember it anymore. I don't remember it anymore. Let's just move on from here and let's do better now. Wow. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. God says this. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Do not let your past hold you down. Do not let your past hold you down. Don't let it keep you from enjoying the present and seeing the future. God has something great in store for you. And God says, don't dwell on the past. Don't look backwards. Don't think about anything that happened in the past. You know, in the context, what he was saying is, you know what? Great things have happened in the past. The, the Red Sea was parted and uh, people walked through on dry ground. And, and God sent... Um, you know, his, his presence through the wilderness as a pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. He said, don't even think about all those things. I'm doing something brand new. Those things might have been great, but I'm doing something completely new. But I think this principle is also true. God says, don't look back in the past at all the bad things either. <laughs> don't look at your past and think about all the rotten things that have happened in your life and all the times you failed and all the times you, you let God down or you let somebody else down. God says, don't you be thinking about that. He says, I want you to look forward because I'm doing something new. I'm doing something new. Don't you like new stuff? I love new stuff. New things are great, man. They're shiny, they're clean, they're crisp, they're, they're wonderful. I love new things. And God says, I'm doing something new in your life. I'm going to do something new. And then he says something like this. He says this. He says, I'm making a way in the wilderness. You know what a wilderness is? It's a desert. 
It's a place where there's, there's not development. There's no landmarks. There's no highways. There's, there's nothing. It's just wilderness. It's a bunch of, uh, it's a bunch of cactus and dirt, sand and, you know, coyotes. We got a coyote that lives around the church. Jennifer saw it the other day. He was walking around and she said, that's an ugly dog. I said, that's a coyote. <laughs> he lives around here and he is ugly. That's, a, that's the wilderness. But God says, you know what? When you walk around in the wilderness, you can't find your way. You don't know what direction you're supposed to go. But God says, I'm, I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. I'm going to show you the direction to take. Even when you're in a wilderness with no highways, no signs, no directions, God says, I'll give you direction. I'll make a way where there is no way. I'll give you a highway in the middle of a wilderness, in the middle of nothing. God says, I'm going to pave the way for you. And then he says, and then he says, in streams in the wasteland. Streams in a wasteland. A wasteland doesn't have streams. A wasteland doesn't have rivers. It doesn't have resource. God says, you might think you have no resources. You think you have nothing in your hand to work with. But God says, I've got everything in my hands. And even if you're in a wasteland, even if it looks like there is no way, God says, I'm making a way and I'm providing the resources too. Your God provides the resources when you have no resources. I'm so thankful for that. And I know it's easy for me to get up here and preach this and say, oh yeah, God provides for us. And some people are living from day to day wondering where's the next paycheck going to come from? How am I going to buy food next week? But I'm telling you, we must trust our God. He will not let us down. If we will follow the way that he's made in the wilderness, then we will also be able to drink of the resource that he's provided. God wants to make a way for us. We have to, our, our job is this, trust him. Trust him. And obey him. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey isn't that true? Trust Him, obey Him, follow Him. And I'm telling you, God will make a way in the wilderness. He'll provide rivers in a wasteland. He will restore your brokenness. And He sees value in who you are. That's the God we serve. That's the Christmas message. That's better than any present under the tree. That's a message that you and I can take to the bank today. I'm so thankful we serve a God who sees more in us than we ever saw in ourselves. Aren't you? Let's, let's stand up and pray.